Hi and welcome. We're giving everyone a chance to get signed in right now. So glad to have you joining us today. I'm Lisa from the library and with me today is Barbara Trish Osio from the Legal Aid Society of San Diego. We are so grateful to the Legal Aid Society, not just for the services they provide in our community, but for allowing us to, to tap their personnel and their staff attorneys to be speakers for the library. We so appreciate it. And uh, Barbara today will be talking about probate conservatorship of the person, which is a topic I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about. So I'm really looking forward to the presentation today. A couple things. Real quick before I turn things over to Barbara that I would like for you to know, we are offering CLE credit for today's webinar for those of you who would like to get it. You will be getting that by email, uh, certificate by email later today. We just need to go into Zoom and verify who attended before we send those out. Um, we also, as always, have a short survey that we have a link to at the end of the presentation that you will see. We'd sure appreciate if you take a minute or two to fill out our survey. Always like to get feedback from our attendees. And finally, if you do want to ask questions of Barbara today, and I'm sure some of you will, she will be answering those probably more toward the end um, to be able to get through her presentation. But we ask that you use the Q&A icon to do that. So you will see an icon on your screen that says Q&A with two little speech bubbles. That's where we would like for you to put your questions. And one of the nice things about the Q&A feature is that you can either ask them by name or anonymously, your choice. So if there's anything you'd like to ask. We would like to ask as far as questions, though, that you keep them general because this session is not for individualized legal advice. It's really just an educational session. So um, we appreciate your cooperation with that and keeping the questions general. I think that's everything I have. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Barbara. Hello, I'm Barbara Trish Osio from Legal Aid Society. And I will be talking about types of conservatorship and the conservatorship process. I run the legal aid clinic for conservatorship. And just so you know how that works, it's first come, first serve. There's no appointments. It's not legal representation. Everyone I assist remains in pro per. So it's in person on Tuesdays and Thursdays from nine to three. It's on the fifth floor of the courthouse. We do use volunteer attorneys, so, so if that's something you're interested in, check out our website. Now you are required to consider alternatives to conservatorship before applying for conservatorship. Conservatorship should only be granted if it's the least restrictive way to protect the proposed conservatee. In uh, form GC312, which is one of many required forms, you are required to consider alternatives to cons to conservatorship and say why they won't work. And rebuttable presumption of capacity is something that everyone has, even if they have a disability. Some of the primary alternatives to conservatorship are advanced healthcare directives and durable powers of attorney. Those can only be executed while someone has capacity. So in a lot of situations, that's not gonna work. There's also representative payee. That is a program that the Social Security Administration has. The VA also has something similar. I believe they call it fiduciary. So for those, for representative payee, you could have capacity or not have capacity. And you don't necessarily need to be a power of attorney or a conservator for that. They have their own process. So that's a good thing to look at if you need to control some, um, somebody's benefits. And you might be able to do that without a conservatorship. So a conservatorship is a protective court proceeding where a judge, based on clear and convincing evidence, appoints a responsible person to care for another adult. So that's the nice way to put it, but you could also think of it as a lawsuit that takes away someone's rights. Of course, sometimes that is in their best interest. So the parties are the proposed conservatee. That's the person who is lacking capacity, who needs help. The proposed conservators. There could be co-conservators who should be unanimous or decide by majority. Usually we do it with one, two, or three conservators. So if there was three, it could be two against one. There is a order of preference, but this would only come into play if there are multiple people competing over who should be the conservator. Otherwise, the uh, order of preference would not be something that, that needs to be looked at. 
So the petitioner uh, is usually also applying to be a conservator themselves, but petitioner and conservator are slightly different positions. And the petitioner could be anyone interested, a relative, a government entity, a friend. And the petitioner is usually applying to have themselves be a conservator. They could also be applying for co-conservators. The proposed conservatee is the person that you are trying to pr protect, the person who lacks capacity and needs help. Objectors, uh, it, in, for what comes through my clinic, I probably only see about two to 5% of cases being objected to. Mostly it's a matter of proving up your case to the court, getting through the probate examiners. There's a lot of steps, so that isn't easy. There's a lot of forms. If you want the complete packet of forms, you should find that on the court website. They have a complete packet of all those forms in one big PDF. So there's different types of conservatorship. There's conservatorship of the person and conservatorship of the estate. Conservatorship of the person is to provide for health, food, clothing, and shelter. Conservatorship of the estate is to manage financial resources and or help reduce fraud and undue influence. And Legal Aid Society, my clinic does not uh, help with conservatorship of the estate, although I can make exceptions sometimes for very small estates, 15,000 or less type of states. So in addition, there is limited conservatorship and general conservatorship. Limited conservatorship is for people who grew up with a developmental disability. And general conservatorship is for people who had a disability that developed after the age of 18. So general conservatorship is most commonly things like dementia or brain injury after the age of 18. Temporary conservatorship can also be asked for in either kind. Temporary conservatorship requires urgency and temporary conservatorship should not just be routinely asked for because it will only be granted if it's urgent. And it's uh, quite a bit of additional work because then you have to do all the regular forms plus more forms and you have two court dates and two court dates you need to give notice of. So I would not routinely ask for temporary only if you really need it. And then there's also LPS conservatorship that's for mental health and that has to be brought by the county public conservator. It's different than probate conservatorship. It cannot be brought by a family member. It needs to be bought, brought by the public conservator who works for the County of San Diego. And LPS just stands for Latterman Petrus Short, which is the name of the legislatures who uh, created the law in the seventies. So limited conservatorship, the purpose is to protect health, welfare, and safety, preserve civil rights. It's only for those with developmental disabilities. They are customizable. There are seven powers. Those seven powers are only, grant, only granted, if, if they must be enumerated or else they weren't granted. So they must be specifically asked for and specifically granted. And you look to the orders and letters to know which of the seven powers are granted. So conservatorship is only for adults, it's not for children. However, you can start the process when your child is 17. Some parents really wanna have it in place right on the 18th birthday. So you can start when they're 17. So the most common developmental disabilities are Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, autism, and intellectual disability. For a limited conservatorship, a regional center report is required. So if you have a child with a developmental disability and you believe you'll be applying for conservatorship, it's a good idea to already have your, your child involved with the regional center. So the powers of a limited conservator, there's seven enumerated powers and the enumerated powers must be specifically in the orders and letters or else you don't have those powers. However, you also have inherent powers, care, custody, and control under subsection A of that statute. So care, custody, and control you have, except for the enumerated powers you only have if they're specifically listed. So the powers are deciding where they're gonna live, access to their confidential papers, right to give or withhold consent to marriage, control their right to contract, medical consent, basically decide who their friends are and make educational decisions. So if you can see if you have all seven powers, and then if you look at part A, care, custody, and control, 
you can see that that's actually a pretty robust conservatorship if you have all seven powers, even though it's called a limited conservatorship. The duties of a limited conservator, you must decide whether they're gonna live, arrange for their healthcare meals, clothing, personal care, et cetera. Also try to help them develop maximum self-reliance and independence. That's important because often you are getting a conservatorship over a very young person who might still be able to continue to develop. You must treat the conservatee with understanding and respect and consider their wishes. So for general versus limited conservatorship, the court is authorized to grant a general conservatorship if the, if the developmental dis disability is severe, um, but you usually should go ahead and start, start out asking for a limited conservatorship because the regional center report is required. So the powers and duties of the general conservator conservator of the person, you have a fiduciary duty to act prudently and in good faith, take action in the conservatee's best interests, accommodate the conservatee's wishes, care, custody, control, and education, personal care, fix least restrictive residence. That means don't put them in a facility if that isn't needed. If um, keeping them at home will meet their needs, that's the preference. So there are powers that must be separately requested in general conservatorships as well. The medical power and the power to consent to marry must be separately requested and separately granted even in general conservatorships. Now, medical care power is something that's almost always requested. That's usually one of the primary motives of even applying for conservatorship. Now, both of those powers, medical and marriage, are part of the seven powers. So if you ask for all seven powers in a limited conservatorship, you would have already asked for the medical care power and the power to consent to marry. Dementia powers are add-on powers that you can ask for, for in a general conservatorship. There must be a dementia diagnosis. Uh, you do not have to request these powers just because someone has dementia. You only request these powers if you need them. There's two dementia powers. You don't have to ask for both. You could just ask for one or the other. So it's placement in a secured perimeter care facility. That's like to control wandering and administration of dementia medications. Those are the psychotropic medications. And these powers must be specifically requested and specifically granted. The conservatee will also will always retain certain rights. The, the conservatee will uh, retain their right to control their own salary. Most conservatees do not work are not working or not employed for wages. So that's not relevant for most, most conservatives, but if they earn a salary, they can control it. They may still have the, um, they may still be able to make or change a will. The fact that they're a conservative wouldn't automatically mean they can't do that because the capacity to execute a will is lower than the capacity to contract. They will still have the right to marry unless that was specifically granted to the conservator. They will usually retain the right to personal mail visits and telephone calls. They will retain the right to be represented by a lawyer to ask a judge to change the conservator or to ask a judge to end the conservatorship. They will retain the right to vote unless a judge specifically says they are unable to. And that power does not transfer to the conservator. So either the conservatee retains the power to vote or that power to vote is just extinguished or at least extinguished until ruled otherwise in the future. Uh, and the, uh, the conserv conservatee will retain their right to make medical decisions unless that's specifically granted to the conservator. But again, it usually is because the conservator is usually requesting that or else they wouldn't need a conservatorship at all. Um, the, and the conservative team may retain rights to enter into transactions to the extent necessary. So there will be limitations on the conservator's power. The conservator cannot place a conservative in a mental health treatment facility against conservative's wishes. Probate conservators never have that power. So again, if you want that power, you need to contact the public conservator who works for the County of San Diego probate conservators do not have the power to place conservatives in a mental health treatment facility against conservatives' wishes. I'm repeating that because this actually comes up a lot at my clinic and I can't help. 
Um, you cannot administer experimental drugs. You cannot authorize convulsive treatment. You cannot have the conservatives sterilized. There actually is a special petition to ask for that, but I think that's very rare. So LPS conservatorships are mental health conservatorships. The person must be gravely disabled as a result of a mental disorder or chronic alcoholism. The Welfare and Institutions Code applies. So for LPS conservatorships, you're, you're looking at the Welfare and Institutions Code. For probate conservatorships, you're looking at the probate code. LPS conservatorships can only be initiated by the public conservator. They require a psychiatric evaluation. The temporary conservator will always be the public conservator that lasts 30 days. The so-called permanent conservator could be the public conservator or a, a family member that they designate uh, and it must be renewed annually. So the permanent isn't necessarily permanent, but what they call a permanent LPS conservatorship is a year and the temporary one is 30 days. The conservative will be re represented by a defense attorney, which is usually a public defender. And the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, evidentiary standard. For probate conservatorship, the standard is clear and convincing evidence. And the LPS conservator will have all the powers that a general conservator would have, plus they have the power to place them in the psychiatric facility and authorize psychotropic drugs. So establishing a conservatorship is a multi-step process. First step you is meeting with the client, or in my case, we call it a clinic participant because they're not clients, they stay in pro per. So you're deciding who is the petitioner, will there be co-conservators? Does the, does the proposed conservatee live in San Diego? Um, the conservatee determines the venue and jurisdiction. You wanna think about it, if, is conservatorship appropriate and make sure you know which kind you wanna apply for. You're gonna gather information. If you practice in this area, you should have a questionnaire because there's a lot of information to gather. You could have your proposed conservators check out GC314 and make sure that they're comfortable with all those questions because it, that is the screening form. It's a, like a little background check for each proposed conservator. So you wanna complete the file, complete and file the petition and, and the supporting forms. There's judicial counsel forms, there's, there's local forms, there's attachments. You will be required to do some attachments and you could use MC025 or you could also just do your attachments on pleading paper. So forms are periodically updated. You must use the most recent forms. When you file, you'll be given your hearing date and time. Propers are allowed to file in person at the probate business office on the third floor. Electronic filing is now required for attorneys, but not for propers. The fee waiver is based on the income of the conservatee. The fee waiver is important to, to fill out and file if, if they qualify for it, because there's a lot of expenses, because it's not just the initial filing fee, there's expenses that could be ongoing for, for years. So if they qualify, you should file a fee waiver. Uh, the fee waiver, well, they will almost always qualify for a fee waiver in limited conservatorships. In generals, it's more variable whether or not they will apply, whether, whether or not they will qualify for the fee waiver. But because it's based on the, the conservatee, for limited conservatorships, the conservatee is normally going to qualify for the fee waiver. The petition is form GC310. It's the same form for generals and estate and for limited, for person and estate and for limiteds and generals, it's the same form for all the different variations. There's lots of boxes. It's really easy to check inconsistent boxes. It, it's uh, hard to fill this out properly when you're not familiar and if you don't have a sample. Uh, you need to try to only fill out boxes that are relevant for the type of conservatorship that you are applying for. Part 5C, you're gonna describe why the conservatee needs a conservatorship, talk about their diagnosis, talk about why they need help with health, with fit health, food, clothing, and shelter. You are going to list first and second degree relatives. You need to use the residential address of the first and second degree relatives, not the PO box. 
first and second degree relatives are parents and grandparents, children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters and spouse. You are going to list all four grandparents. I only have one listed there, but you're gonna list all four grandparents. So you're gonna say in the name, you're gonna say the relationship to the conservatee. If they are deceased, you will write that they are deceased instead of their address. If they are a minor, you will list their age. If uh, you ha don't have one of the categories, you'll just simply say no spouse, no grandchildren, for example. So you want to count for all of those first and second degree relatives. Okay, box 3F, we always check that and do a, a 3F attachment. So 3F1 is about uh, conservatives relatives. So if you didn't, if you weren't able to provide the address for some of those relatives, first and second degree relatives, you can start to give the court a reason right there in your attachment 3F1. Uh, a reason might be the petitioner has not seen the proposed conservatee's father in 18 years. So that could be the kind of thing that you would put in 3F1. Or if you know where everyone is, you could just simply state uh, all relatives whereabouts are known. And then in 3F2, you want to um, show that the conservatee uh, agreed to this to the extent that they're able to understand it or that they can't understand it at all. So that you can have a conversation with the proposed conservatee Something like, is it okay if mom and dad continue to help you make decisions? Uh, conservative says, yes, that's great. So you can put something like that in your 3F2, or you state that it's not feasible to ascertain those preferences because they don't understand the proceedings uh, and can't express their opinion. So you do not have to for file Form GC330. Form GC330 is not used in San Diego. In San Diego, there's a standing order to appoint the court investigator if the court wants it. So you can check the box 13, but you don't actually have to file the GC 330. You do have to file local form PR 020, referral information and list of relatives. And that form does get looked at by the court investigator and the court appointed attorney. That also is a confidential form. This is the, this form was, was updated March of 2020, always use the most recent version of the forms. This provides key information for the court investigator, court investigator and court appointed attorneys. It'll, it'll, if there's a day program, if they're in school or any other day program, it has to have that address, that information, the language of the proposed conservative, any safety information, medications that they may be on. The GC312 is a confidential form. It's not public record. However, it can be requested by the parties. It includes the proposed conservatee's date of birth and social security number. And then in part two, you need to, again, just state why a conservatorship is needed. And sometimes you, there's nothing confidential to put in there. Just go ahead and repeat what you put in 5C of the GC310, which is, the, which is a public form, the petition. So it's fine to just do a repeat, but you can also add confidential information if any of that, if any of that applies, th uh, things about physical abuse or substance abuse you might put in this form. And also uh, part five of the GC312 is where you have to go through and show that you've considered alternatives to conservatorship and rejected them because they won't work. The GC314 is a confidential form. Only the court has access to this form. This provides info to screen the proposed conservators. So it has your social security number and your date of birth. It asks how long you've known the conservatee and your relationship to the conservatee. And then there's a number of have, have not questions. So if you answer affirmatively to those screening questions, you just need to have an, an attachment with an explanation. The doctor's capacity form, form GC-335, you might want to fill out some of the basics for the doctor. If you know for sure which doctors you're gonna, you're gonna use, you might wanna go ahead and put, put in the doctor's name, address, and telephone number for them, put in the conservative's name for them. Uh, doctors frequently do not date their signature or do not 
thoroughly fill out this form. So sometimes you do have to take this form back to the doctor. Doctors frequently do not date their signatures and they must date their signature both on page one and on page three. The doctor also can express an opinion on whether they should, on whether or not the proposed conservatee um, can attend the hearing. And that should match what you say in the petition about whether or not the proposed conservatee can attend the hearing. And this question is about like physical ability to attend the hearing. It's not about whether or not they'll understand it. It's totally fine for the proposed conservatee to be at court and not understand what's happening. So this is about physical inability to attend court. At this point, the court is allowing hearings in person and also via Microsoft Teams. So there's a lot of uh, uh, flexibility there. So M MS Teams or in person, either one is okay at this point, but the conservatee should normally be attending the hearing. Duties of conservator, this is form GC 348. This is more to read than to fill out. It's also acknowledging receipt of the handbook. And the handbook is 318 pages. It's available for free online. You do not have to read the whole thing from cover to cover because it, in, it covers person and estate, general and limited. So the conservator should feel free to only read the parts that are relevant to the type of conservatorship they're applying for. After you have filed your paperwork and know your court date, you're gonna start working on notice and citation. Citation is uh, the notice to the proposed conservatee and it must be personal service. It's form GC 320. You must serve that and you also serve a copy of the petition, which is the GC 310. Under local rules, you also need to fill out, uh, serve those forms that they, that they give you when you file. Um, it talks, one of them talks about eligibility to e-file there's, but there's actually two of them. And you need to uh, get this service done at least 15 days before the hearing. Again, it's personal service and the service needs to happen regardless of the proposed conservatives understanding of the proceeding. So the citation gets filed twice, which can be confusing. When you file it the first time, the proof of service does not need to be filled out. When you file it the first time, it gets stamped on page one and two. You file it again with the proof of service page completely filled out. They st actually stamp it on page three when you file it the second time. The notice of hearing is form GC020. You can serve by mail. The regional center must have at least 30 days notice. The first and second degree relatives must have at least 15 days notice. You serve children 12 and older. You can serve uh, children that are younger than that in an abundance of caution and, and definitely must if, if they don't live with somebody who's being served. Uh, from time to time, you must serve the veterans, the veteran services, director of state hospitals or tribal leadership, depending on your case. So if you didn't know where all the relatives are, you should, now also start working on form PR 182. That gives the court more reason to hopefully uh, waive your obligation to notice a relative that you don't have information for. So you're gonna file your completed GC 020, your notice of hearing with proof of service completely filled out. If you had missing relatives, you're gonna work on form PR 182 to hopefully give the court a reason to to waive that requirement for that relative. And then an alternative for relatives that are local and that you see regularly is just have them sign a waiver of notice. There's not a court form for that, but you can just make a simple one way, one page waiver on pleading paper. And that's an alternative to serving local relatives that are not opposed. The next thing is court appointed uh, attorney reports, investigator reports and regional center reports. So the court investigator is usually not required for limited conservatorships of the person. The, cons the court investigator visit can be un unannounced. It's gonna cost $800 unless that fee was waived. Their report is due five days before the hearing and it must be served on the parties. The regional center report is required for all limited conservatorships. 
They make a recommendation on each of the seven powers uh, and they must have their report in at least five days before the hearing and they send their report to all of the parties. The court appointed attorney for the proposed conservatee also needs to do a report. And since COVID-19 started, there's been a court appointed attorney in all cases and they're required in most cases anyway. They were, they're always required in limited conservatorships and many general conservatorships. And since COVID-19 started, the court's been appointing them in all the cases. So they're gonna represent the proposed conservatee's wishes if those wishes can be determined. They must file a report. And the cost, if the conservatee cannot afford it, if the conservatee doesn't have an estate, then the judge will order the county to pay. The next step, you're going to be checking probate examiner notes, trying to correct defects and submitting your proposed order. So you want to try to, try to uh, check the probate examiner notes. Sometimes those are ready about two weeks before the hearing. Try to correct defects if you can. Defects can cause delays. You're gonna find probate examiner notes online. You can submit an amendment or supplement to correct defects. There's also a local form PR 177. So you can use that to um, respond to probate notes or do an amendment or supplement. If there's a defect in a confidential form, just go ahead and resubmit it. So if there's a problem with a GC 314 or a GC 312, just file a new one. Um, and some of the defects are not are not controlled by the petitioner and cannot be fixed by the petitioner. So that would be things like uh, missing reports from the court appointed attorney and the regional center and the court investigator. The petitioner can't do anything about that. If you don't understand the defects, you should try to contact the probate examiner and communicate with them directly. Proposed order, you wanna do your proposed order before the hearing. The proposed order is form GC340. If you're submitting it in person on the third floor, they like this, they have this cover sheet PR 162, which they want on blue paper with a self-addressed stamped envelope. So <clears throat> this is how pro pers are doing it. Court appointed uh, attorneys are probably just filing this electronically at this point, but GC 340 should definitely be filed before your hearing, if at all possible. You wanna have a proposed order filed before your hearing, if at all possible. If you didn't do that, bring copies of, and you're attending in person and you didn't get this done, bring copies of your proposed order to the hearing. The letters used to be, you used to be able to submit them in advance, but now they only want them after the hearing. The letters are form GC350. They're very important, best part of the best form out of all of these forms. So make sure you get that uh, filed right after the hearing if the conservatorship was granted. So for the hearing, you may want to observe first if you haven't done this before. If, if there's defects, the most common uh, outcome if there's defects is that they will be waived or a continuance will be granted. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes the hearing might just be taken off calendar, but usually when there are defects, the defects are waived or a continuance is granted to give you more time to work on your, on your defects. So after your conservatorship is granted, there's still two more forms that you're required to do. There's the form GC341. That must be filed within 30 days of appointment. The conservator mails the notice, the GC341, with a copy of the order, the GC340, to the parties. They file it with the court. So it's really only the proof of service part that needs to be filled out on this form but you must mail a copy of the 340 and the 341 to the parties and then file the 341 with the proof of service filled out. The GC 355, this is the determination of conservatives appropriate level of care. This form does not need to be served. It does need to be filed and um, it's needed for possible future review hearings. It's due within 60 days of appointment. So you just give details on how much care the conservatee needs and what, what they need to stay in their residence. And you file it at the probate business office like everything else. So review hearings can be set if you don't do these last two forms and you, there can also be review hearings set for other reasons. 
If you don't do these last two forms, you also get a failure to perform duties that comes in the mail. It gives you a warning to do those last two forms. An orientation class may be ordered. That is uh, check your order to know whether or not it was ordered or, or maybe, you'll, maybe you'll remember whether or not the judge ordered it. These do not get ordered in limited conservatorships very often, or at least that's not the norm. They're ordered in generals more often. Right now, you can view the court website and the, uh, the class is a, is a YouTube video. And so you just watch it and then you submit your certificate of attendance to the clerk, which is local form PR 186. So your letters of conservatorship, GC 350, these are your proof of conservatorship. You give copies to the schools, the doctors, the hospitals, the pharmacies, insurance, banks, post office, other government offices, anybody who needs proof of the conservatorship, you give them a copy of the GC 350. Uh, the, the people who want proof of conservatorship may, re may require a certified copy, but you wanna give out photocopies of the certified copy, not the actual certified copy. So photocopies of the certified copy, but the certified copy shows that the letters were still valid on the date they were certified. So that's why people may want that because the file stamp on front just shows the day they were originally filed and later there could be amended letters. So that's why, that's why certified copy of the letters is important because then you know it was valid on the certified date. So review is ongoing in these cases. So even after a conservatorship is granted, you will always see the case status is pending unless the case has been dismissed or something. So even if the conservatorship is granted, the case status will show up as pending because review is always ongoing. Court investigators every year or two, uh, there, there can be a fee, but if there was a fee waiver, there shouldn't be. If there's an issue, the court will set a review hearing. You must keep the court informed of your address changes. So within 30 days of, of, the, uh, of moving the conservatee, you must file, a, you must let the court know that they, were, that they moved. The, the form number is GC080. If you are moving the conservatee from, from their home to a facility, you're supposed to also give 15 days advance notice of the move, and that's form GC 079. There is a petition and hearing required to move the conservatee out of California. Uh, there is no interstate process for, for limited conservatorships, only for general conservatorships, but it still takes some work, that interstate transfer. Um, and, and again, it's not possible for limited, it's only for generals. And you also must keep the conservator's address current with the court. You can use form MC040 for that. If you need more info, you should refer to the handbook for guidance. Uh, you, you should take an annual photo of the conservatee. This is needed in case the conservatee ends up missing. If you have a small estate case, there's an annual waiver of accounting and that is form PR 149. There's other annual things you need to do for conservatorship of the estate, but I don't, I don't help with that. So if I was helping with a small estate, this would be the annual form to do. Removal of the conservator can basically happen for any reason that the court finds is in the conservatee's best interest. So conservators can be removed. Conservatorships can last, the probate conservatorships, they can last for decades, but they also can terminate. So they terminate at the death of the conservatee or order of the court. If the conservatee passes away, you're supposed to file form GC 399. Uh, the petitioner or the conservatee or someone else could use form PR 187. That, that's a petition to terminate the conservatorship. That's a local form where you can request that. If a conservator dies, the remaining co-conservators can seek amended letters. And sometimes when one of the conservators dies, the, the parties wanna add a new co-conservator. So then you do a new petition to add an additional co-conservator. Okay, uh, I, I'm ready for questions. I got through that quickly. Hopefully I didn't read too fast. So. 
We do have some questions, so let me get started with reading a few of those. So we have one for, from Jonathan. He is asking, powers over finances is a part of the conservatorship of the person. When do substantial finances require a conservatorship of the estate? Is there some threshold regarding the assets? Um, so, so part of the reason that you might need conservatorship of the estate, one of the questions is what are the finances? So you don't need conservatorship of the estate if someone only has social security, for example. Um, conservatorship of the estate, yeah, you would have to show, I, again, so conservatorship of the estate isn't really my area, but yeah, you have to, it is a, it is a high bar though, because every, everybody makes, everybody has a right to make bad money decisions. So I guess I'm not really sure if I'm answering the question, but yeah, you do have to show that they're making really bad money decisions. And also there has to be an estate. You don't necessarily need a conservatorship of the estate if someone only has um, social security, for example, there's other ways to, to handle it. So I don't know if I answered the question, but hopefully. We have another question from Robert. He's asking why the use of uh, attorney guardian ad litem in this process? Um, in some cases, there would be a guardian ad litem. Is, is he talking about the court appointed attorney or guardian ad litem? So those are different things. Well, his question is, what, why are why are attorneys being used in this process? I, I presume he means the court appointed attorneys you were mentioning. Okay, yeah. So mm -hmm. court appointed attorneys are are required in all conservatorship cases. At least these days, they're required in all conservatorship cases. Um, so the it's to preserve the rights of the proposed conservatee, and it's also more information for the court. Uh, you know, the 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 court appointed attorneys they they meet with the proposed conservatee. They they send a report to the court. It provides the court with more information. Um, so it, it's, it gives the court more of a reason to know whether or not to grant conservatorship. And it also uh, protects the conservatee. Uh, we don't need um, conservatorships to be granted without the conservatee having uh, someone to stand up for them. So uh, you know, sometimes the proposed conservatees are not, are not verbal and they can't necessarily have a normal attorney-client relationship but it's extra protection for the proposed um, conservatives. And, and Robert posted a, a follow-up comment that he has seen both guardian ad litem and attorney appointed for a conservative with the guardian, guardian ad litem also being an attorney. Yeah, I, I've seen that. Um, it, I think that's more unusual. I think that's only in complicated or more complicated cases, but yes, that happens. Mm -hmm. I think it's because the roles are different. So the, um, the court appointed attorney is supposed to advocate for the proposed conservatee's wishes if they can be determined. Whereas the guardian ad litem, who, who may be an attorney as well, but they have a different role. So their role is more um, best interests and, and maybe not as much adver advocating for the proposed conservatee's wishes. Cause you see, uh, you could imagine that a proposed conservatee's um, uh, what they say they want and what's best for them could be two different things. So that's why those might be two separate people. Yeah. And where is the court finding the court appointed attorneys, Barbara? It's a panel. Um, they have a yearly training, which is always in early December. Um, but yeah, it's a panel. There's like a list of 20 of them or 25 of them. I'm obviously not in charge of that, but yeah, there's, uh, I, I do have an idea how that works. So there's a panel, there's a yearly training. Uh, the court does look for, for more people to add to that panel. Um, there are some requirements. You have to do a CLE. Uh, I believe you have to have been attorney of record in at least three conservatorship cases. So there's some requirements to get on that panel, but yeah, there's a panel and they just go around and around and just assign them randomly to people on that panel. So another question we have from an anonymous attendee is whether Legal Aid publishes a walkthrough workbook for lay people to follow when they are seeking conservatorship. Um, this attendee uh, was aware that you once offered some kind of a packet, um, but not in a workbook style, more of a model. So can you comment on that at all as far as any resources for someone trying to do, uh, do this as a self-help? So... 
so I do have samples that I, but I don't, I don't just give them out. So you got to, you got to come in, you got to fill out a little intake. Basically we have to have a way to like prove who we're helping, if that makes sense. So we don't have anything like officially published, but we do, we, we can give out samples. We can answer questions. So the best thing, if you want help is just come in, just come into the clinic. Um, I can also sometimes provide remote assistance on uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Sometimes there's no guarantee of that availability um, in person on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the courthouse. But yeah, I don't have like an official published booklet or work, work, workbook or anything like that. A question from Robert, when a conservatee dies, how is probate and winding up of the conserv conservatorship coordinated? So those would be two completely separate processes. The conservatorship just um, ends at death. Uh, well, again, I don't really help with conservatorship of the estate and that's pro this is probably more of an estate question. But yeah, the conservatorship does end at death. And so uh, wrapping up, yeah, that, this is more of an estate question because if there was an estate, there would be final accountings, but I'm not the best person to ask for that. But what I would say is maybe not apply for a conservatorship for someone who you're pretty sure is going to be passing away real, real soon. Um, it's probably not worth it. So conservatorship is really only for the living. It's only for the living that are going to be surviving with a disability for a while. Uh, you might want to think about alternatives and whether or not it's worth it if someone's not going to be um, surviving with their disability for quite a period of time. So we have a question from Daniel, Daniel, and he has some acronyms here. So hopefully you know what they stand for because I do not. Um, Daniel asks, could you go over an example of when a conservatorship of the estate or person is still obtained even when the conservatee has a DPOAF and AHCD? Okay, so he's talking about powers of attorney and advanced okay. health care directives. So, um, uh, if those were found invalid, or if the person applying for conservatorship was trying to invalidate them, so some so if somebody else had those was holding those powers of attorney, advanced healthcare directives, and the person now applying for conservatorship doesn't think that person is doing a good job and wants to try to get those powers of attorney and advanced healthcare directives canceled, that would be a reason. Um, another reason would be um, if people were not. Uh, honoring those documents. Sometimes advanced healthcare directives and powers of attorney are not uh, really accepted by people that you try to show them to. It's still it's still worth it to execute them. I'm a big, big advocate of people executing those documents, but um, they aren't, they haven't been blessed by a judge. So somebody is looking at them and trying to decide whether or not they, whether or not they're valid, even though no, no judge has said they're valid. So they're not always honored. Um, so yeah, normally when a power of a normally when a conservatorship is asked for, when those documents exist, it's because uh, they're not working, and they might not. They may maybe not working because uh, they're not valid, or somebody thinks they're not valid, or sometimes the agent listed in the power of attorney or advanced healthcare directive uh, is not caring for the person properly. So a different person is then trying to apply for conservatorship and invalidate those documents. So that, so that also can happen. We have two attendees who actually asked uh, pretty much the same question, and that is, what happens if a sole conservatorship, uh, a sole conservator in a limited conservatorship of the person passes away? You know, what, what happens then? Well, the regional center can play a larger role when the developmentally disabled person's not conserved. So, I mean, a new family member can apply that would be fine. Um, but the regional center should be able to help them make decisions and, and decide whether they're going to live and authorize medical care if necessary. So the regional center would be, would take over, not exactly, not exactly take over, but sort of, in, unless a new family member applied, which could happen, a new family member could apply. So another attendee is asking about, um, you know, that you had indicated one alternative to conservatorship is the durable power of attorney. Um, what do you suggest in a case where the, the person who um, needs the help 
does not want to sign a durable power of attorney, although their mental state is declining. Is that the type of case where you think a conservatorship might be in order? Possibly, although if they're being um, difficult for the power of attorney, they might also be difficult for the conservatorship. So it could be a problem. Either way, it could be a problem. It is more challenging to get a conservatorship over someone who doesn't want to be conserved. Um, so, And I know it's hard to give advice in this setting, so maybe this uh, attendee could you know, get, get a hold of you or participate in the clinic to get more information. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a couple of comments in the chat as well. How often does the fourth district appellate court get involved in appealed probate conservatorships? Um, I, I don't know. I don't, they're not, not that often. <laughs> and, and then they're also asking, are there no issue briefs sent back if there's no merit for appeal? Uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I, there's not, I don't know that much about the appeal process that, and that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. All right, we have a few more minutes if anyone else has anything on their mind that they'd like to ask Barbara about or any clarification that they need. In the meantime, I actually had another question of my own. You had mentioned that anyone who might be going through this process can view um, a hearing in another case. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Are these hearings being conducted virtually or in person? And oh. uh, how, how can someone view a, view a hearing if, if they're interested in doing that? So, so both. Um, so right now they are both in person and online. Uh, so Microsoft Teams, you would go to the website, go to virtual hearings, and you will find the links to get on. All of the conservatorship hearings are on Thursdays. So <clears throat> one of the judges is at 9, one of the judges is at 1030, one of the judges is at 145. So Thursday is the day. Um, and, uh, yeah, you should be able to observe as long as you're not being disruptive or anything like that, you should be able to observe on, on via Microsoft Teams or in person. Sounds like a good idea for someone who might be going through this process. Yeah, yeah, you can learn yeah. a lot from observing. Another question has to do with when you're dealing with someone who has a traumatic brain injury from an accident and there's a possibility of a civil lawsuit and or settlement discussions, when is a conservative, a conservator a more appropriate person than a guardian ad litem to, you know, make that decision or assist with that decision? If, if you have an opinion on that. Um, no, I really don't. Um, yeah, I, 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 that would be, I think that would be pretty case specific. Um, yeah, I don't have an opinion on that. Certainly maybe something in the case of a conservatorship that the conservator would be involved in though. Uh, so if, yeah, so if there was a traumatic brain injury, you might need to be working on a conservatorship to try to help deal with that personal injury case. Um, but those would still be two separate cases that would be, yeah, they would be two separate issues. Um, and the conservator would probably have to be a conservator of the estate. So again, that's not something I have a lot of experience on, with, um, yeah, those are, that's the type of case where you're gonna need to be uh, represented by someone who's handled that before, ideally, that specific situation. Another question, can the public conservator serve as a public conservator for a developmentally disabled person with no family? Um, I don't think so, because the regional center kind of is the one who, who kind of, plays that role for developmentally disabled people who aren't conserved. So I don't think so. Um, well, the, actually though, a public conservator could be someone who, someone who qualifies for a limited conservatorship because they have a developmental disability could also in theory also qualify for an LPS conservatorship if that's the question. Um, so the, an LPS conservatorship, sometimes mental illness and developmental disabilities uh, coexist. So in theory, someone who qualifies for an LPS conservatorship could also uh, qualify for an LPS conservatorship. So if that's the question, um, the public conservator would be the conservator in the LPS conservatorship. Um, however, the public, the public, this is confusing, confusing, but the public guardian 
is public guardian, not public conservator. Public guardian is the one who can be a probate conservator in general conservatorships, general probate conservatorships, if there is no uh, appropriate family member who is stepping up to do it. Um, I don't know if that answered the question or not. Uh, Christian is asking, do you have the option of choosing the limited conservatorship or is it based on certain criteria? So which you apply for is developed on, is it based on the conservatee? It's not based on what the petitioner wants, really. Um, so you really should apply for limited conservatorship if, if it's a developmentally disabled person and apply for general conservatorship if it's not a developmentally disabled person. So again, limited conservatorship is for people who grew up with their disability. We're talking about autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, intellectual disability. And then general conservatorship is for people who became disabled after the age of 18. It's for dementia. It's for brain injury due to a car accident, a motorcycle accident, a stroke, um, other types of brain injuries that occur after the age of 18. Um, so it's, it's not really personal preference of the petitioner. It's which one is appropriate and which one is appropriate depends on the conservatee. Another question, in cases where a person who is named as a proposed conservator in a living will, how is that different from the powers they would possess from a court approved conservator? Is that even a thing? Can, can you name a proposed conservator in a living will? Um, so you could, but that's not a court order. That's just saying who you would want to be your conservator if one is appointed. So that's more like um, a nomination or, or like a, you're just stating who you would want to be a conservator if one was appointed. But putting something in the living will is not a conservatorship. So that person would still have to go through this process with the court forms that you've been describing. Yeah. I, I suppose it would be good evidence in the case, though, that this was the person's wishes. And it would, it would help if there were multiple people competing over who should mm -hmm. be conservator. It doesn't make the actual conservatorship case simpler. It just would help in the event of um, objectors or multiple family members competing over who should be conservator. Okay. All right. Well, I think this is a great time to wrap up. It's just about one o'clock. I want to thank you so much, Barbara. This session was packed with information. And the slides were emailed out to folks that were registered for today's webinar earlier. If you didn't get them, I'm going to be sending you all an email with the CLE certificate. And so feel free to reply to my email and I can make sure you get the slides if you didn't get them already. And um, we, we just got a question about the recording being posted. Yes, Barbara has given the library permission to post the recording. It will be on the Law Library's YouTube channel. If you don't know how to find that, the Law Library's YouTube channel is linked on every page of our website. So check the library website right down at the bottom of the homepage and you, you'll see our little YouTube symbol for the link there. I can't tell you exactly when it will be posted. It will probably be before the end of the week this week. So thank you everybody for attending today. And thank you, Barbara. Really appreciate the information. Thank you. Thank you for watching everyone. I wish I could have seen your faces, but, but thank you for, for watching.